Thank you, Tamsin, and thank you for having me here today. And thanks all of you for attending. I trust that this will be a helpful and insightful session for you. Starting off with an introduction to the Impact Trust. The Impact Trust is Nexi's nonprofit arm responsible for research and advocacy that will benefit and help scale the impact investing sector. We address barriers to impact investing and focus our activities on support to financial advisors, marketplaces, intermediaries, investors, and social businesses in the impact capital sector. Specifically, our activities include increasing access to information, expertise, capital, and supportive networks that are committed to growing businesses that have an intentional social or environmental purpose and impact. In this way, the Trust strives to build the bridges to connect committed impact investors to high-impact investments in world-changing initiatives. So our definition of impact investments. We believe that impact investments or social businesses must demonstrate primacy of social or environmental purpose and intent. This means having a specific and clearly stated positive social or environmental mission as one of the primary reasons for that business's existence. Generally, this also involves specific measures that are taken to ensure that purpose or mission is protected and cannot be sacrificed for the sake of financial profit. Clear and central purpose is also protected and articulated through a theory of change, which forms the basis for performance assessment and indicators to demonstrate output, outcomes, and social and or environmental impact. A theory of change is essentially a visual representation of an organization's theory for how they will affect change and depicts their causal logic generally reflecting objectives and any assumptions that may have been made, activities, target audience, resources, outputs, and outcomes, and how these will be measured. As Tamsin mentioned, there has been a webinar that was hosted specifically on theory of change recently, and that was a really helpful introduction. So I'd encourage you to, to listen to that if you, if you weren't on that webinar. Um, and then looking at impact performance and measurement monitoring systems and reports. These are systems um, and commitment to the ongoing monitoring and evaluation of impact performance and reporting that you and that's using clearly defined indicators to inform impact reports. And then finally, a sustainable business model and a market orientation. This strategy can be impact first, finance first, or a combination of both, but it must demonstrate a market-based approach to its operations and at a minimum be able to provide a return of principle to its investors or lenders. In terms of framing impact investment, it ultimately seeks to assist in moving towards more equitable and sustainable decision making to include socio-economic and environmental issues in investment decisions. Socially responsible investment broadly considers social, economic and environmental factors in its investment decisions. It is often a more passive process, primarily employing screens or filters in order to identify investments that meet the investment criteria. Impact investments, on the other hand, aim to proactively solve social and environmental challenges while generating financial profit. And this is um, as defined by the Global Impact Investing Network, or the GIN. So we understand that to mean that their positive social or environmental objectives are central to their mission and core business. Looking at an introduction to due diligence and really just trying to demystify what that is, due diligence is an investigation or an, or an evaluation of a potential investment. It can be a legal obligation, but the term more commonly applies to voluntary investigations that are conducted to inform business and specifically investment decisions. Due diligence is a key step in a typical investment process. It is often referred to as the process through which a potential purchaser will evaluate a target company or its assets for investment. The purpose of due diligence is to determine and fully understand the respective project and its potential impacts before taking a decision on whether or not to take a proposed action. The process serves to confirm all material facts with regards to sale, agreement or transaction. 
So looking at the key principles for effective due diligence, the first one I would look at is objectivity. Due diligence needs to be conducted objectively and ideally performed by an independent third party to avoid any conflicts of interest. Having a defined process for managing workflow, recommendations and outcomes and integrating people, process and technology can be particularly helpful in contributing to an objective process. The goal should be one system and process that everyone uses on a consistent basis. This demands the development of standard templates and tools that can be used for assessing third parties. This in turn requires training to ensure that all users can effectively apply and maintain the principle of consistency. The process of due diligence is made replicable through the implementation of consistency and the use of standardized templates, tools, and processes. Effective management oversight is important in providing for a robust third-party due diligence process. It is also, also useful for identifying inconsistencies and where processes, tools, and training need to be reviewed in order to maintain consistency or that need to be adjusted to cater for challenges in trends and practices that might be happening. Reasonableness addresses the question, how much is enough? In efforts to avoid investing in the wrong people and relationships, a sensible and well-thought-out process that incorporates a risk-based approach is really the best strategy for ensuring that decisions are reasonable and defensible. In considering risk, it's important to interrogate the assumptions that have been made in the logic model and to assess both internal and external risk factors. Here we can see a visual overview or example of a typical investment process. In impact investing, we recommend the same investment process as traditional investments, but with the additional overlay of impact considerations in addition to corporate and financial considerations. Hence, for the purposes of this webinar, we are concerned with the investment evaluation or due diligence within the context of impact investment. So you're probably asking yourself at this point, what is the difference then? The key difference between traditional due diligence and due diligence in the context of impact investment lies in the content that is considered and reviewed rather than in the process. Fundamentally, the process is the same, but with a particular focus on different elements. For example, in traditional due diligence, you might focus on considerations such as strength of management team, revenue forecasts, and the risk and return profile. In impact due diligence, you would focus on impact-related capacity and demonstration of high social and or environmental impact by the prospective investment. The high social or environmental impact is then considered within the context of your overall organizational performance, capacity, and the potential to provide an appropriate financial return to impact investors. And moving to look at the more practical side of impact investment due diligence, You'll likely recognize the steps involved in this example of a due diligence process. It simply reflects the key steps that are involved in a typical due diligence process. We will be considering each of these steps and how they, would, they are addressed within the context of impact investment. And I am, am, am aware that there have been um, some delays on the slide. So in case you do have a delay, we'll be looking at desk review, field work, follow-up engagement, report development, and recommendation as the, the kind of key steps of that overall process. So starting with desk review or desk research, desk research as a whole is an essential part of the due diligence process. During this phase, evaluators or project officers, whichever term type of term you may use, will begin their journey as investigators and have a responsibility to be as thorough as possible, gathering evidence from multiple sources that will support the decision to either continue on the evaluation path with a particular application or not. Desk research also enables evaluators to conduct a substantial amount of research and investigation at a relatively safe distance. This helps manage the expectations of the organization, which are often raised when visits are set up. 
it is important that evaluators remember to manage the expectations of the organization they are working with at all times. Some of the key questions that you um, might want to consider at this stage to help you either make a recommendation for the progression um, of the application and then also to inform any field work that you might do. I would start off looking at the context and really saying what is the context of the prospective investment. Consider the country or the region its particular cultural issues, gender dynamics, history, etc., and gain an understanding of appropriate good practice solutions to addressing these challenges. This is important both in terms of your engagement during visiting, so your actual personal engagement with the organization, but also in terms of your consideration or assessment of the program design. So, for example, um, um, if you were going to be visiting in certain um, cultural contexts, dress becomes particularly important. Women, for example, when um, when you're visiting certain parts of Af Africa, and it's often um, you know there's a there's an interplay between culture and religion as well. But often in those contexts, you would want to be um, respectful and considerate to the cultural norms that are there, and probably wear long sleeves. You're not going to walk around and you know something that's short or sleeveless. Um, so those kind of um, considerations come become quite important when you're conducting visits. But then also um, in terms of, as I mentioned, the kind of program design side of things and targeting beneficiaries appropriately um, in different contexts, different um, different factors might be at play there. For example, I came across one project where um, it was a large-scale project and they had um, made the, really designed their program on the assumption that there was a male as the head of the household who was making the financial decisions. And this program essentially hinged on that. And they were having, you know, discovering all sorts of issues in, in their impact and then traced it back to the fact that in that area it was actually a matriarchal type structure and the woman there was a woman at the head of the household who was making the financial decision so they'd actually been targeting the wrong family or household member which had huge significant um, impacts for obviously the rest of the rest of the program. Um, so those are the kind of um, considerations that you would that you would really want to look at um, in terms of context and then really trying to research and understand what has worked in this context before and then why or why not. So you you are, can obviously um, avoid making the same same mistakes or really build on what's already been found to be um, successful. So really, ultimately, you want to be as informed as possible before entering a scenario and understand the context that you're going into. Then in terms of the program logic, does the prospect have a clear program logic that is evident in something like a theory of change framework or a clear logic model? And is this consistent with your knowledge of good practice? So you know, very broadly, does it reflect vision, mission, and activities that are consistent with the objectives and outcomes um, that have been evidenced? So really, it's that, um, taking that example of targeting the wrong beneficiary, there was a fundamental um, flaw in their, in the activities stage, so they were never going to be able to um, to achieve their desired outcomes based on the activities that they were implementing. So that kind of logic model or theory of change framework really provides you with a bird's eye view to be able to, to look at, consider, and really test the logic and, and how that whole theory um, fits together and you know it really is a great um, a great way that you can that you can really um, come to grips and and um, understand how all of those pieces fit together. Then in terms of track record, does the organization have a good track record? Um, both of operations and practice generally and then also specifically in terms of their impact track record. 
Here, I would encourage you to look at any evaluations, preferably external, um, or certifications, ratings, etc., that might have been conducted or can be obtained to date. Um, so there are increasingly more and more of these types of um, certifications, ratings, etc., coming out. Um, for example, Gears ratings, B Corp and Fair Trade certifications, etc. Specifically in terms of impact track record, you would want to review impact reports and seek demonstration of the system that's been used to track and measure impact performance. So again, looking at are they using any standardized industry reporting frameworks or systems? This is becoming increasingly important in order to attract traditional for-profit investors to the impact investment space. Um, and that's also something that's been highlighted in a recent Alliance article on good data for big capital. Specifically, they indicate that investors must be able to access data on the non-financial performance of impact investments and that this data needs to be comparable and reliable. Hence the call for a common data and reporting language on the use of standardized indicators and metrics to facilitate this. As um, I've mentioned before, Nexi has hosted webinars with examples of um, some of these tools and services, such as Gears, the SROI methodology, PPI, etc. Um, and as Tamsin also mentioned, the recordings of these are available from the Nexi website. And so in considering track record, uh, you should also make use of references to conduct thorough reference checks. Uh, you really can learn a lot of information just by chatting to people who already have experience with um, the people that you are um, reviewing. And yeah, relationships speak volumes and you really do often just get a lot of insight through through conversation and, and really conducting those reference checks. So they can also be very valuable. And in terms of sustainability, is there evidence of a sustainable business model? Here you'd want to review annual reports, audited financial statements, business plans, budgets, etc. And um, you know, you're really going to do that to consider the sustainability of the project and, the Im and their impact intended or actual to date. Uh, and then consider things like, do they say they will raise funds to sustain it in the future? Could this have an impact on the sustainability of this project? For example, if they don't manage to raise funds for subsequent phases or particular components, how does that affect the kind of impact forecast that you are anticipating or the, the return on investment that you are looking at in terms of the social or environmental return? So, um, yeah, if you're considering investment in a particular project, you would really want to understand that quite um, quite thoroughly. And then also um, something that can be helpful is just, um, you know, that organizations should try and match their objectives uh, from a social environmental impact perspective with their financial resources and how they can make the most of their resources at each stage, ideally growing incrementally in accordance with their market and demand. So essentially, I mean, that's the basic principles of um, kind of business growth and development. So, you know, starting off small and then scaling in accordance with the demand and the market that you have. Often that's difficult when you are um, looking at um, social environmental projects because often there's a, a temptation or a tendency to to kind of do a huge um, capital outlay or a huge kind of um, initial kind of ramp up um, and sometimes people um, do that prematurely um, and you know so I would I would say that yeah, the basics of growing incrementally in accordance with your market and uh, that might be beneficiaries or kind of traditional clients depending on on what you're doing and, and what your model is but um, to really grow in step with that and or at least have some kind of a pilot project where you really are um, testing your proof of concept so that um, so that you can be sure when you scale that you are doing it appropriately 
And then um, you would also definitely want to look at any additional make or break criteria that would be specific to your investment mandate. So, for example, um, for Nexi, mission protection is essential in any of Nexi's marketplaces, and it requires the ongoing formal involvement of an impact director. This role can be fulfilled by an individual director or it can be outsourced to a service provider who can perform the function for the social enterprise. So that's an example of a... Sorry, are we on? Yes. Hi. I just wanted to say sorry. Everybody seemed to have lost sound. Um, oh. I hope that, that you've all got sound back again now. Sorry about that. Um, no, that's again, fine. it will be recorded, and so the pieces that you've missed will be on the recording. Okay, sorry, should I carry on from here or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Sorry, let me just minimize this again. Okay, so I'll just um, make that last point again then in case. So looking at the additional make or break criteria, I gave the example um, of a of a one criteria that's specific for Nexi, and that is mission protection as being essential in any of Nexi's marketplaces, and it requires the ongoing formal involvement of an impact director. So um, what I was saying is this is an example of something that's a specific criteria that you would want to consider if you are applying for admission um, or listing in any of um, Nexi's marketplaces, but that you might have your own examples of specific criteria, such as your beneficiary profile. Perhaps you are targeting women or men specifically. Perhaps you are targeting SMEs um, or infrastructure projects, etc. So, of course, you would want to um, really look at what your criteria are and include those considerations or questions at this early point as well so that you can um, make a make a good recommendation on whether to proceed or not. Then just some general reminders um, is to build a paper trail as you go along and that goes back to um, the the um, principles that we discussed as well so really it is something that's defensible so if somebody ever has a question for you on your process on the information etc you can really be transparent and you can you can defend that um, because you've got um, the appropriate paper trail um, as you know if even if you were to be audited that's that's becoming increasingly um, increasingly common that the impact um, assessment or diligence that's undertaken might actually be audited as well. Um, so you really want to have that paper trail in place. And then just brush up on your people skills. The desk research phase is um, the project officer's first direct engagement with an organization. And the rapport that's established at this stage can have significant implications for your relationship with an organization and even a particular individual, potentially over an extended period of time. You may need to work with this person a long time, so it's worth putting effort into starting on the right foot. In, um, in terms of discussing peer review, peer review is the process whereby a topic or piece of work, in this case specifically related to prospective impact investment, is submitted to a group of peers for review and input. For example, you may circulate an application to your peers to assist and contribute to a go or no-go decision. Peer review provides the opportunity to gain insight from different perspectives and from peers with a range of skills and expertise. Essentially, we would recommend using peer reviews at each key decision stage of your process. So that is when you have work and supporting evidence um, for consideration to inform either proceeding or declining an applicant. We believe peer review is an essential component contributing to the integrity of the entire impact investment due diligence process. The peer review team should ideally include individuals with a range of expertise and experience in particular sectors. You may choose to only include internal team or access more broad input from external experts as well. The range of experience and insight should contribute to the rigor and depth of assessment and to the team's understanding of context and good practice versus failed models. And that goes back to um, this kind of 
key principles and considerations in terms of context and what has worked and what hasn't, it's really, really useful to have input from people who who know exactly what's going on in a particular sector. So I would say it's a, it's a great and really valuable resource to draw on because they can alert you to some of those contextual um, issues as well as any kind of um, either strengths or potential weaknesses based on good practice and what's, um, what's worked or what hasn't worked in the past. In discussing fieldwork, it's an essential component of due diligence in order to practically assess the capacity and suitability of a prospective investment. It affords evaluators the opportunity to really go out, kick the tires and check under the hood. So what are some of the fundamentals for developing your tools that you might use in your fieldwork? A range of replicable, robust tools and methodologies to address your key questions is important. These can be organized into key sections such as purpose, governance, finance, impact, etc. Your key questions should address your investment criteria and mandate, which we've discussed a bit before. And I've got here um, an example of a tool that could be incorporated into your fieldwork assessment or something that could be adapted. And this is McKinsey's Organizational Capacity Assessment Tool, or OCAT. This was originally designed to help NPOs assess their organizational capacity, but certainly it can be used um, as a useful interview and assessment tool for third-party diligence. It is a matrix-based tool with a range of questions and correlating ratings from one to four, where each number corresponds to a description relative to its level of capacity. So literally it gives you the guidelines on what constitutes in relation to a specific element, whether an organization has a clear need for increased capacity or whether they already have a very high level of capacity in place. Similarly, the so second example that I've got here, um, which is from Keystone, and this is a matrix-based constituency voice framework reflecting indicators, the evidence you would consider in relation to this, and a range of scores relative to that evidence. So um, really here in terms of constituency voices, it's, it's really looking at your, your stakeholders, your beneficiaries, etc. These are just two examples. There are others and some use a combination of matrix-based tools with open-ended qualitative interview guides, risk assessment tools, etc. So um, you'd want to include a range of tools and stakeholders to ensure that you get a full picture from multiple perspectives. Be sure to include beneficiary voices as a core stakeholder group. And remember to look for clues. Sometimes we can learn a lot just from observation and assessing what might be missing from a picture. And often that um, prompts us to ask um, Questions that can really, really be helpful in, um, in completing that picture for us so that we can really get a sense of, of what the situation on the ground is. In terms of follow-up engagement, um, these are essentially the steps you would take in order, to, in order to ensure that all your information is captured and will appropriately support your report and recommendations. So essentially going back to the point of um, your paper trail. Broadly, these steps of preparation would include scanning and uploading all your fieldwork documents so that they are definitely recorded, reviewing all your fieldwork notes and materials, checking for any gaps that might need to be followed up with the organization, actually following up where necessary, and then compiling your project profile or due diligence report and including all your assessments there. Then finally, you would circulate the report to your team for review and input prior to um, the, the peer review session so that they can be um, informed and prepared for that peer review session. Then you would move on to um, report development and your final recommendation. If you have an existing report template, I'd suggest that you review this to consider and ensure that it covers all of the key information that you require in order to make your recommendation. Um, some examples of sections you may like to include are 
alignment to your criteria, impact risk profile, the impact details, so looking at current and future impact, reporting and measurement of the organization under consideration, looking at their governance, technical assistance requirements or recommendations. And remember who you are writing the report and recommendation for and address the key concerns. So the great thing about um, the fact that you are going to be presenting in all likelihood to some form of committee um, who will make the decision is that that will be made up of people and people tend to be um, relatively consistent and um, you can get to know them. So if it is a group that you are reporting to on a regular basis or consistent basis for these kind of decisions, really take the time to um, and, and pay attention to what, what are the key concerns of each of those people. For example, one person might be particularly interested or concerned about succession planning in an organization and they might always ask you that question. Um, Another person might be particularly concerned with the beneficiary profile. So get to know the people so that you can anticipate what they're going to ask and um, and really speak to that. Um, write and speak for your audience. It will it will make the whole process um, much easier and it can it can streamline things for you. So reflect on your investment criteria and all the question the key questions you've asked along the way and make sure that these are included in your report and that they are highlighted where necessary. This will enable impact investors or investment committees to make an informed decision and will reduce time spent on unnecessary follow-up questions. So for example, um, it's kind of elaborating what I was um, suggesting a point ago, but um, if there are, you know, if there's a key piece of information that you have overlooked or haven't included on, for example, your beneficiary profile, and this is something that's one of the criteria, it's going to take um, really unnecessary time for you to then go back, find the relevant information, and potentially sometimes these kinds of um, approval committees only meet on, you know, specific um timelines or a specific schedule so you might have to then wait for the next one etc so you really want to have um checked yourself that you you are answering all the questions that are likely to be asked and that you are as prepared as you possibly can be and that that your report is as comprehensive as it possibly can be um in order to be able to, for for them to actually make the decision so, you know, sometimes just look at it from a different perspective in terms of saying, well, if I was somebody who was coming at this report cold, because remember, they don't, they haven't done all the research, they haven't read all the information that you have, all they've got is your report, and possibly some supporting documentation, but you can't rely on the fact that they will have read that. But so your report needs to tell them everything they need to know to be able to make their decision. So you really do want to spend some time reflecting on that and checking that you that you are um, actually providing them all of that information. Okay, just some points there. Yeah, so highlighting your investment criteria and um, and anticipating any key questions that they might ask you. And that's it for now, Tamsin. Great. Thanks very much, Gabriel. Thanks. So just to remind everyone, if you want to put in your questions, just enter them into the questions bar on the right-hand side. Um, Gabriel, I'm going to go through some of the questions that mm. have now been put to this. Great. Um, but please, everyone, just make sure if you have a question, just put it in that question bar. Um, the one first question here is, what kind of relationship exists between the due diligence process and the reporting, the monitoring, and evaluation process. Do you need investments to report in a specific way according to your due diligence process, or are they independent of each other? Okay. So I would say absolutely, and um, there is a very strong relationship between the two. So if you see your due diligence um, process as essentially pre-investment or listing or whatever 
your kind of um, final engagement or relationship finalization may be. So it's the process that leads up to that. And then your reporting and monitoring and evaluation um, that you do at a later stage, um, I'm sure it will be according to regular intervals, often that's on an annual basis, but that should be reporting back against the information that was um, provided and understood, etc., during your due diligence process. So your due diligence process and essentially that report and the recommendation that you make will or should provide the foundation for what they are going to report against. So likely during that due diligence process, there's going to be information around what is the actual ask. So what are they asking you for? Um, what are they going to do? So again, you know, it goes back to that whole kind of theory of change or logic model type scenario where you're then looking at, so this is what they're asking us for um, in order to achieve these objectives and goals. They're going to implement these activities. This, These are the outcomes that they are anticipating, and that's what you're going to hold them accountable for. So they need to report against what they have promised, essentially, um, during that due diligence phase. So absolutely, I would say that they are very, very closely related and essentially part of a, a bigger um, process um, altogether in terms of from the kind of um, application phase right through to the close of the project, your reporting is essentially just what happens after your initial investment. Thank you. Um, the next question has the, the presentation of due diligence as you described it is more around how investors are approaching it. But if I'm a social business, that is about to undergo a due diligence process with a potential investor, what are the key things I should be looking at and what documents should I be making sure are in place for that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, I would say as far as possible, I mean, you, you want all your traditional kind of company information ready to go. So your company profile, annual reports, financial statements, um, et cetera. So anything that's a typical kind of um, due diligence information pack that people would want to know about you. And then in terms of your impact, you really want to try and anticipate. So the things that I've gone through, things like um, what is actually your, your theory of change or your logic model for how you're going to achieve what you are going to do and how you are going to be and what you're going to be accountable for actually um, and then um, how you're going to report against that so that's something that's very helpful if you've already got that in place um, also uh, a couple of the elements that we mentioned um, during the presentation but not specifically in this in this way is what are your um, your kind of impact reports? Ideally, if you've got anything external that adds credibility to who you are as an organization, you would want to include that in your information pack, going to prospective investors or grant makers, etc. So really any kind of certifications, ratings, external impact reports, etc. that really does demonstrate that you that you are actually having the impact that you that you are um that you have been committing to and so yeah so essentially whatever you've got in place that can demonstrate your track record is also hugely valuable and i would i would probably start there great another question is is there a substitute for field work if there is a budgetary limitation for a full extensive field work operation, what are the substitutes that could be um, used instead of that? Hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, um, that is a good question. Budget and um, is something that really is um, concern, and I think increasingly so where we, where we are um, in financial terms these days. So, um, Different organizations essentially um, might just have that very extensive and thorough desk research phase and potentially conduct some telephone interviews, etc. So possibly, I mean, I would say you don't want to 
um, skip out getting stakeholder or beneficiary input. So in some way, you want to be able to get that, whether it's depending on who the kind of level of um, capacity and kind of online access that they have. It might be that you can send them online questionnaires or surveys for completion to give you feedback in that way. It might be that you can um, set up calls with them. You can actually get a list of all the kind of clients or beneficiaries telephone numbers and you can do randomized telephone calls to really um, chat to them and, and get information from them in that way. So um, there are ways around that, but I would say depending on the level that you are looking to commit and invest, I mean, if you, you know, I would say that's probably fine on the smaller kind of scale of investment, but at some point, um, I would say it is a good thing to go and actually see it if you can, because um, uh, unfortunately, um, there have been some horror stories of where people can produce all sorts of information um, that's very convincing um, and actually they might not have been, they might only have developed one site, for example, um, when, you know, they've been given capital to, you know, roll out in different regions or something like that. So I think if you are looking at a longer term relationship or um, a larger scale investment or grant and um, that you would really want to as far as possible go and see it if you can and I think if I can just add to that mm. um, certainly from Macy's perspective and um, given the other movements around social stock exchanges or um, online trading platforms you know the IIX in Asia and the shoe dog platform um, also in Toronto in Kenya the KSEC there are a number of platforms that are providing the baseline hurdles for investment opportunities to pass. And so through them are growing local capacity to kick the tires and to represent or do due diligence on investments. And so one of the alternatives to doing your own field work is to build the relationships with those networks, you know, the um, Absolutely. Asian banks. Venture Finance Network, the European Venture Finance Network, all of these are starting to really build um, capacity around using the, the skills and presence of network members. So those are, mm. are good ways to look for that. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Um, sorry, Tamsa, just also on that, um, as an, sorry, just you sparked a thought in my mind, but um, in another kind of extension of that is that a lot of the the kind of ratings and certifications might involve practical site visits as well. So you might actually be quite comfortable um, if you've had line of sight to what their process is, the questions that they've asked, the people that they've visited, etc. Depending on the nature of the um, the rating process, that you might be quite comfortable with that. So again, it's another version of that. You know, somebody has laid eyes on this project. It doesn't necessarily have to be you directly. Another question, Gabrielle, mm. is um, given the definition of impact investing and the fact that the tent is being very broadly defined, what is the most specific demonstration that a social business can use to indicate that it is an impact investment? Is it the theory of change? Um, what are the other kinds of tools that can be used to prove in a due diligence that you qualify as a meaningful impact investment? Hmm. I think um, that varies depending on where you are because there have been huge developments in certain areas where now um, social businesses or social enterprises might have a recognized legal structure. So by virtue of the fact that they have been incorporated as, for example, a community interest company in the UK or a benefit corporation in the United States, there's a huge amount of comfort and you can you can really accept based on that that they are actually a social business or a social enterprise. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened everywhere. So, for example, in South Africa, there is a, um, a situation where um, there is no recognized legal structure um, for social businesses here. And so often they have some form of hybrid entity operating where they might have a nonprofit um, arm and then a for-profit arm as well. Um, so you'd want to look 
obviously again at the context so so what is really available in that region um and so i think those are very useful where you can also um we mentioned um things like gears ratings um which is also a really great way that you can um look at an organization because you can also understand then um what elements because they look at different scorecard elements within the gears rating so where you know where they actually sit so where they are on that kind of continuum of social environmental as well because um, I think they have a specific category there as well for social environmental business models over and above great, um, you know, employment practices, etc. So there you can also get a more detailed insight. Um, yeah, so I hope that's helpful. Great. I think we're going to take one more question, but let me quickly just answer two questions that have come up. Is will these slides be available? So yes. As we mentioned before, they will be it will be on the nextu.com website, and you will be able to download that. Second question was: Is there one single place where different types of tools can be assessed? Um, you know, there are a growing number of places. One of them is the Tracy website, which is tools and resources for assessing social impact. Um, there is also GrantCraft. There is the Social Impact Analyst Association. Um, obviously, go and look at the other next few webinars on social evaluator, constituent voice, and PPI. Um, and then the GIN website um, also provides various links to tools as well as the keystone. Um, many of these have actually emerged more out of the charity space than out of the financial market space, but it at least gives you a guideline. And then, Gabriel, I think one more question here for you before we wrap up is. I assume the process should be the same if one is due diligence and impact investment fund. How do you check on the fund, though, especially if it is a startup? Mm, that's another great question. Um, so, yes, absolutely. The process should be the same um, if you're looking at an impact investment fund. However, the, the kind of scope or scale that you're going to be looking at is larger because obviously that fund's social environmental impact is dependent on the underlying investments that it's made. So you would need to have a line of sight to those underlying investments, what their impact is, and then how that fund is reporting, uh, and how that their uh, impact really contributes to the, um, the impact that is reported by the fund. Again, and I promise I don't work for Gears, but Gears is also an interesting um, tool that's, um, that's used a lot in this space where a lot of funds are actually becoming Gears rated. And then, as I understand it, the Gears rating then would look at each of those underlying investments. So if that's in place, that's a really great way to um, to have line of sight exactly and you know consistency, et cetera, along what's being reported. Um, and then in terms of if the fund is just starting up, again, I would look at you want to have line of sight to what are the investments that it's made or making um, and what reporting they've got in place. So you would you'd essentially apply the same lens, the same questions to those underlying investments. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gabrielle. And thank you to all of you for attending um, this due diligence for investment session of the next year theory. Um, we do look forward to getting your comments through the survey and your suggestions for next year's um, seminar series. So thank you very much for attending today. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks, Tamsin. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.